What are some uh, bone grafting options in spine surgery? We've talked about instrumentation. We've talked about um, different form, Im important aspects of understanding balance. We've understood what it is to get corrections to maximize our uh, outcomes. And we know this from our quality of life data with respect to our alignments and so on. But at the end of the day, remember that all the correction that we place, the instrumentation that we place, is there purely as a scaffold until fusion takes place. And we achieve our ultimate goal of being able to reconstruct or achieve our goals with respect to reconstruction and alignment uh, with the deposition of autogenous bone. So, so fusion is ultimately our goal here. And it really is a well-placed arthrodesis between two uh, potentially mobile segments in the spine supplemented by instrumentation that we place that acts as a scaffold until that race between arthrodesis and failure of that instrumentation occurs due to cyclical loads and fatigue and, and stress and so on. So grafting is a critical and essential component of, of what we aim to achieve. But it's not easy to achieve it. It's, in fact, very complex. There are, there's multiple different aspects to uh, the bone deposition cascade. Uh, for our orthopedic colleagues, this is probably old hat for you. Uh, for those of us who uh, start with, with a more neural understanding and have expanded to um, our, our skeletal structures in total, uh, it really is it, it's an important cascade to understand because there are important key steps within this process that can be affected by what we do as clinicians. So the first thing that I want to say is that uh, it is incredibly uh, cellular, obviously. It depends on signaling uh, proteins, growth factors, and other uh, important aspects that are still in evolution of understanding. Uh, you will not achieve a fusion unless you have three critical structures. And one is uh, clearly the cellular aspects of the cascade, the osteoblast, the osteoclast, osteocytes, and so on. Uh, you do need some form of induction uh, in the form of signaling proteins and growth factors, and it needs to occur over a scaffold or some form of structure by which uh, the deposition of the bone can occur. And, and most importantly, and I think uh, something that we forget is that there has to be uh, important supply, nutrient supply, blood supply, and hence angiogenesis uh, in order to achieve uh, this goal. So you've all kind of learned the three things, osteoge osteogenicity, osteoinduction, osteoconduction. There is angiogenesis. But the other factor also to consider is that your graft needs to be a load-bearing structure. It has to support uh, the goal of, of your arthrodesis. So do not forget that Im very important aspect uh, in terms of your graft selection. So what are the options here? I think we're familiar to, to, to most of this list, but not maybe completely. Uh, one is that autograft uh, is, is clearly the gold standard here, and it's been the case uh, for many, many decades. And we're all familiar with what that means. It's typically ili iliac crest bone graft, uh, and uh, that, that is the ideal gold standard when it applies to fusion, not just spine surgery, but, but other forms of fusion. But local bone graft is also a particularly important option uh, because it's immediately accessible and it is associated, as we'll see, with significantly less complications from the uh, harvest of the gold standard of the iliac crest bone graft. Allograft has become uh, an a incredibly important adjunct, uh, extender, uh, poor replacer of autograft uh, in, in the last few decades of spine surgery. And the major reason why it hasn't been as effective, it's very osteoconductive. The scaffold is, is particularly strong. Uh, it's, it is resistant to compression and shear forces, but it lacks uh, those all important signaling proteins, and hence it is not osteoinductive, unless uh, you alter its preparation. And that's what DBM does, and we'll get into that a little bit. BMP, you're all familiar with it. Uh, it's incredibly powerful, uh, but it has its problems, as we'll see. Uh, 
Mesenchymal stem cells are, are a newer uh, kind of product, but now there is good data on their efficacy. And the horizon is things such as tissue engineering and gene therapy, and we'll, we'll talk about that soon. So, okay, so we, we mentioned autograft. So obviously uh, it, it contains all three uh, components of the bone cascade and deposition uh, pathway, which is that it contains the osteocytes themselves, there is osteoinductive material, and it's scaffold as well. And as I said, uh, typically we think of it as a, a, a iliac crest bone graft, but it can be from the rib, it can be from local tissue, fibular struts from the patient, and so on. Uh, it's the gold standard, we said that. There's no risk of infection transmission because it comes from the patient uh, as compared with allograft. And there is minimal, I, I can't quite say not completely, but, but there really shouldn't be due, due to the fact that the major histocompatible comp, uh, comp, compatibility complex is present, there really shouldn't be an immune response. What are the problems? So, so look at the first line. Chronic pain at the donor site, up to 52.7%. Uh, that is not an inconsiderable uh, problem. And I think that uh, for those of us that were trained uh, really uh, by, by our orthopedic mentors, uh, as I was partly in residency as well, and for us it was a gold standard and the standard therapy to obtain uh, iliac crest bone graft, for example, for an ACDF, and it still is for many patients, they, these people often complain of the donor site as being the predominant source of their symptoms and pain, as opposed to the actual uh, side of the procedure. But there are other problems with it. Obviously, uh, there's a risk of infection during the, the process of transfer. Um, there is nerve injury almost uh, always around all of the autographed options that are important nerves. For example, uh, as Dr. Tubbs has told you, uh, no doubt uh, we have the cluneals, uh, the proximity to the superior gluteal, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, uh, specifically for iliac crest bone graft. And yet, uh, of course, the other thing about it is that it is in limited supply because you kind of have a couple of shots at, at, at getting it right. Uh, maybe uh, incorrect angulation of that osteotome or whatever tool that you use, and uh, there goes away that side. All right, what about allograft? So this is clearly uh, allogeneic material harvested uh, typically from a cadaver. Uh, it's wonderful uh, in terms of osteoconduction because that uh, all-important honeycombed lattice structure for the scaffold is preserved. Uh, it lacks, uh, it, it, and I, I would say that there are caveats to this, it does lack osteogenic uh, properties in, in general unless it's prepared carefully, for example, with uh, hydrochloric acid and, and uh, demineralization uh, um, alternatives such as DBM, as we'll see. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a great osteoinductive agent. And it can be used alone, or you can use it to supplement, you can uh, take cortical chips, so you can have a mixture of cort cortical and cancellous bone chips. Uh, it, it's very effective uh, either as, an, uh, as a standalone but also as a supplement to uh, that milieu of, uh, of bone graft uh, that, that you want to create. For example, in anterior cervical discectomy infusion, often uh, there is uh, some degree of stem cells available from the marrow that's present, so you have your osteoinduction. And when you stabilize it uh, with a plate and screws, it, it tends to be uh, an, an effective uh, intermediate uh, bone grafting uh, solution. There isn't any surgical additional risk because you're not taking it. There, there is no lack of donor. Um, uh, there is lack of donor morbidity or mortality, obviously, uh, and it, it definitely uh, is of unlimited supply depending on the budget. So uh, obviously there are significant cons to it. Um, it is a poorer form of achieving arthrodesis with respect to, to autograft. The preparation process itself may actually weaken the graft, and, and that may be an issue. And the fusion cascade will take much longer because you rely on transmigration of cells uh, and uh, protein signaling uh, components to achieve the fusion. 
Uh, it's extremely rare, but there have been transmitted cases of important infections such as HIV, which blew my mind, actually, uh, but also more commonly bacterial infections, viral infections, and so on. Uh, and, and it does obviously have, uh, pose the risk of immune mismatch and inflammatory reactions because of uh, uh, the fact that there is no major hist histocompatibility. All right, so on, on to some more refined uh, uh, options. So DBM is a very nice alternative uh, because typically, as I mentioned before, it is uh, treated with hydrochloric acid and uh, the, the mineral aspect of the bone graft uh, is removed during that process. But the remainder of, of, the, um, of the cascade is present. So, for example, uh, the osteoinductive uh, signaling proteins and so on are considered to still be retained. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very nice alternative. And we're going to discuss that. We're going to discuss uh, ceramics, which have become more modern uh, replacements uh, to uh, DBM and others, particularly uh, when a more rigid kind of structure is required. And, and its advantage, as we learned from the other day, uh, was that it's Young's elastic modulus in terms of ability uh, to resist compression and shear and distraction is excellent. And, and then there's obviously the important uh, BMP and so on. So I want to start off with, with BMP. Uh, basically, um, as we mentioned the other day, it was discovered in the 1960s. Initially, huge amounts of uh, cadaveric uh, material were required in order to distill it and prepare it, in order to come up with uh, BMP, in particular uh, BMP2. There are, there are many different forms of BMP, but the two that are most effective are seven, number seven, uh, which is uh, OP1, otherwise known as OP1, or BMP2. Uh, what's nice is that BMP2 has been uh, generated tissue engineered to be recombinant, and so uh, it's now able to be produced on mass, and the price has been significantly reduced in, in terms of its value and so on. However, it's still, it's still expensive. And while it's incredibly osteoinductive, uh, unless it's supplemented by a scaffold or mixed in uh, with, with a carrier, it's not going to be osteoconductive. And you still need uh, stem cells for the uh, BMP to work on. Because as, as you, you, you saw and you probably know from the fusion cascade, the impact of BMP2 and those growth factors is on the maturation of osteocytes into osteoblasts. Here's the problem with it. The, the problem is that depending on the uh, dosage amount, uh, the entire fusion cascade can be stimulated. And what's at the other end of the osteoblast and osteocyte formation? Osteoclasts and oste osteoclasts. So bone resorption, and we've seen all of this clinically in, uh, in, in, our, in our experience with BMP. So obviously the, the pros are that it eliminates the need to harvest autologous bone and associated morbidity. It stimulates bone growth. It promotes in incredible solid bone effusion. The data on it is not equivocal. It is incredibly effective. And it's effective in patients for whom uh, the fusion cascade components are lacking. So osteoporotic elder elderly patients, those with immune uh, modulated immune responses to the bone uh, deposition cascade. Problems. So I think we're all sort of aware of the controversy surrounding BMP in the last uh, a few years. But basically, I think I want to kind of show you this graph. I love this graph uh, because uh, it, it basically describes uh, the journey uh, of a new technology as it begins in the excitement phase of innovation trigger. Uh, and uh, this graph is beautiful because it, it actually has outlined some of the various different uh, kind of innovations that are around uh, our society at the moment. And it's uh, kind of, you know, charted them according to uh, its uh, progress along this chart. But basically, uh, things like you start out with something like smart dust and 4D printing. 
uh, and that's that's your innovation trigger right there, the the great idea that you came up with, and and it's as it, as it's kind of uh, rapidly adopted by um, uh, similar leaning kind of uh, similarly inclined individuals or uh, companies or societies to adopt the technology. There's this rapid phase, as you can see. Um, I, I love the fact that uh, cognitive expert advisors are at the top of their uh, at the top of that peak. Uh, I, I personally am excited to see the dramatic fall that will inevitably come shortly. Um, but uh, th th there's this peak of inflated expectations, and then it's rapidly followed by a trough of disillusionment uh, as uh, there is realization that the original uh, incredible, brilliant goals that were sort of uh, touted w was, was going to be a pipe dream. Um, and then you hit bottom. Uh, but then there's kind of a slope of enlightenment as, as the technology is modified. Uh, and finally, there's a plateau of productivity. And I think BMP fits this curve perfectly because in 2002, uh, it was um, studied, published, became commercially available, uh, had a rapid phase. At, so at one point, something north of 50% of spinal fusions uh, had BMP. As, as a component to achieve arthrodesis, uh, and it, it made a you know, substantial amount of, generated substantial amount of income uh, for its producers and, and, and others. But uh, around about 2009, uh, significant uh, literature reports on its issues uh, came to light. Uh, and finally, uh, as, you, as you may be aware, in 2011, 2012, and so on, there was significant uh, systematic reviews of its uh, impact, and ultimately a, a open data uh, a source uh, at Yale University was established to ex examine and explore uh, its impact, including its efficacy and side effects. And that's been modulated, and I, I think we're beginning to enter the slope of, of enlightenment. But there, there are many particular problems with it. Uh, as I said before, osteolysis is, is one thing in particular, uh, but there was also painful seromas. Uh, the, 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 the spectrum ranged from promotion of infection, promotion of tumorigenesis, which is now kind of largely being um, uh, discredited through data. I wouldn't say completely. There is still a theoretical risk to it. Uh, there's, uh, as it pertained to anterior inner body uh, fusions such as ALIFs and so on, retrograde ejaculation became touted as a, as a side effect, um, and, and you name it. And, and obviously, uh, the other problems with it is that it's incredibly expensive. And unless you know what you're doing with respect to its physiological amount applied to your s situation, as I said, you can spend a whole bunch of money uh, to actually defeat your initial goal, which is bone deposition. So now it's available in commercial uh, uh, kind of packets where it's extra small or extra, extra small uh, in, in, in terms of kind of decreasing the, the amount used. Uh, mesenchymal stem cells, these are particularly um, uh, uh, interesting because it's basically preparation uh, of uh, and, and prepared bone marrow uh, cells that are washed and cleaned of their uh, immunogenic uh, complexes. And so it's kind of the other end of the ca cascade where uh, those cells are provided uh, and in combination with the patient's own uh, osteoinductive kind of properties, uh, bone deposition kind of occurs. And uh, it's particularly useful when there is no access to local bone graft. So something such as the lateral uh, lumbar inner body fusion and so on, where you don't typically want to obtain bone graft if that is your, your uh, initial procedure, uh, it, it's, it's touted to be, to be effective for that reason. But there are other things as well. So ceramics is, is an interesting, kind of exciting kind of field. Um, we kind of stumbled on it as a profession in the 1990s. Its origin come, goes back to coral, uh, and uh, coral was found, aqualine coral was found to have uh, properties that, as I said before, resembled bone. So it resembled it in terms of its compressive uh, and sheer uh, and distractive uh, strength. Uh, it, was it was able to resist deformity uh, and uh, hence 
uh, it was able to be used as a great scaffold uh, for for the um, promotion of, of arthrodesis. Um, uh, I, I kind of wonder now whether uh, the loss of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, you know, being having a vested interest in that part of the world, could have something to do with the uh, promotion of ceramics uh, in the spine field. But we'll, we'll see. But but the the, the key components uh, to it, different ceramics, is the, is your tricalcium phosphate, your hydroxy apatite. These two can be combined together. Um, the one thing, the one aspect is, is shear, I think, resistance, that angulation, uh, that, that still hasn't been mastered yet. The next major category is, is our tissue engineering, and it's kind of interesting. I know Dr. Uh, Wellington Shu kind of typically kind of presents on this for us, but, uh, and, and he has done uh, very good research with respect to peptides and, 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 and other key kind of uh, a micro level structures that, that are acting as scaffold. Uh, but basically here you have the hydrogel uh, and the uh, synthetic polymers, if you like, that resemble uh, particular polymers. So they're highly hydrated polymers. And so as a result, uh, what they end up doing uh, is providing uh, increased area for bony fusion to occur. I think you still need your osteoinductive uh, 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 factors, uh, but basically it improves the availability of the osteoinductive growth factors and signaling proteins uh, to, to be able to, to lay down bone. And the final category is that of gene therapy. Um, I, I kind of put it here, I, I was going to put it in brackets, but I, it, it is actually being developed, uh, the use of adenoviruses and so on to act as vehicles uh, for uh, BMP2. And, and their main kind of strength is the uh, targeting and the directionality of the, the deposition of osteoinductive factors. So if you can target where you place your uh, growth factors, then you can target the fusion that you get. And if that's the case, you can limit the amount of heterotopic bone uh, ossification and ectopic bone ossification and um, uh, its impact on the neural structures, for example, in the spine, radiculitis, and so on, which are all seen as part of the complication profile of something such as BMP. Okay, so obviously there's no perfect choice. I've talked to you about some grafting options. Uh, you need to consider the number of levels that, that, that you're going to apply your bone graft options to. Uh, but the major part of the equation that we haven't mentioned is that of the patient. So you need to marry your bone graft options according to the exigent needs of the patient with respect to whatever the clinical problem is. So if it's uh, a tumor that you've removed, if it's infection, if they're osteoporotic, if there is failure of prior fusion with previous bone grafting options, these are all considerations that you need to take into effect. And so I, I thought the, the, a nice way of kind of looking at this is to kind of come up with a couple of cases that I've had and really kind of talk to you about my, uh, just give you a couple of experiences with this, um, both good and bad, and make you think a little bit about what, what, what you would do in this situation. So first patient uh, is a gentleman, 31 years old. Background is that he's an immigrant uh, from India, and, and that becomes relevant with respect to his deformity. Uh, chronic low back pain for many years, but he presents now with acute severe onset of unrelenting pain following a simple lifting episode at work. The pain centered in the thoracolumbar junction. He's intact. Here are his standing x-rays, AP and lateral, and the spinopelvic parameters. You can appreciate the uh, degree of deformity there. It is actually a gibbous uh, deformity. Uh, with respect to that acute uh, formation, uh, that acute kyphotic uh, uh, deformity uh, of T12, of, of literally T11, T12, L1, and some of L2, uh, he is uh, unbalanced. Uh, but uh, that I, I would say that's secondary to uh, the the disruption uh, of of his uh, focal uh, kyphotic uh, region it plays into it. Uh, we obtained some bending films, and effectively, we didn't think that there was, at the time, any uh, instability. 
Um, the reason I bring up his background is that there was concerns for tuberculosis, and that was effectively ruled out through appropriate tests. And this is his CT scan. So you, you can kind of imagine um, the, the surgical challenge if your goal was to correct that deformity and, and to put him back into balance. So clearly, um, we, we, we felt that we, we could do something for him. So we, we went ahead and we performed a VCR at T12 and L1, uh, ended up being a long construct. And this is kind of what we achieved here. And basically, we did not use, what would you use? Can somebody offer some ideas as to how they would approach uh, bone graft for this patient, given his particular patient profile? So there was initially some concerns, or there wasn't initial concerns about instability. At the time of operation, just through min uh, physical manipulation, we felt that there may have been some degree uh, of instability, some motion on, on direct um, uh, palpation and, and forward, forward compression and distraction on the spine. Any takers? So I'm getting at you also explaining your thought process behind your, your bone graft option. So We have a volunteer. Okay. Is that right? I found a volunteer. Do you like this one? <laughs> yeah, so I guess with him, there will be two levels of scary you have to get some structure. Mm -hmm. versus a structural graft. Okay. So uh, Tyler Kosky wouldn't actually be very proud of us because we, we did insert an expandable cage here and, and he, to his point that VCR involves a shortening procedure. But nonetheless, you know, we, we, fe <laughs> we felt that this was, you know, of, of enough kind of um, uh, bony uh, removal and we didn't actually put that cage in to expand it, it, it really acted more as a struct graft for us. So you mentioned autologous bone graft. So you would take his, his own bone. Where would you get it from? Probably from the access. OK. Rich source of, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So you have a huge amount of bone graft here, lo local bone graft available here that you can use. And it'll have all three components of the cascade there to, to be utilized. So, so uh, that's an option. Would anybody use the uh, BMP here? Right. Exactly. So, so that was our philosophy. We we felt that he he probably had enough osteoinductive factors there, and that could be combined with a huge amount of uh, scaffold and cells, and that was enough. And uh, in fact, I think I have the. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't. Unfortunately, I didn't have the uh, CT up. But but the next slide was was going to show thick, solid posterior lateral arthrodesis and inner body arthrodesis. Um, you'll have to take my word for it, but but great fusion was achieved. Um, his pain improved probably from a combination of improvement of his sagittal balance, but also correction uh, of the of the perhaps unstable kyphotic deformity, um, and it ended up being a very good option for him. But he's young, and and so so we we fulfilled our our needs of of achieving the cascade with what we had in this patient. Yeah. Yeah, we did both. So, so most um, these days, most kind of uh, expandable cages, and in fact, I, I would say, actually, most implants have windows for placement of, of bone. It's kind of important uh, to some extent too, and unless it's for a T lift graft. I, I don't really personally believe that the window in a T lift graft is is as important to fill. It's great if you get it, but I I, I would rather take what's available, uh, including extenders such as DBM, and put it across the disk space because there's a larger surface area there. And, and, and part of the reason why I believe in, in a, um, 
uh, in, in, a, in a cage, for example, with, a, with an inner body for a telif and plif, is that I do like its ability to achieve lordosis if, if, if you're able to do that and to provide a structural support, so to, to correct disc height uh, loss and so on. But, but for corpectomy infusion, um, I think it is important. Uh, and and we, we often see CT scans where the bridging bone is actually right between the, the goalposts of the of the cage, whatever it is that you put in. Yeah. Doing a two level vertebrectomy, did you still get the posterior elements to, to touch? The vessel? Yeah, I, yeah, that that that's a real good question. Um, it, it, not n no, uh, not not as satisfactorily as as you'd want. But remember, our goal was to correct the deformity, so we had to remove a significant amount of the posterior elements in order to do that anyway because I want to make sure the neural elements are completely decompressed. You know, effectively what this is, is bridging two or three nerve roots together, putting them in one super space, uh, and then having the scaffold there until they fuse. Um, and, and so uh, one, one thing that I like to do is to cover the neural elements, like for example with gel foam, with dried gel foam, and then really pack into that posterior lateral gutter, posterior lateral corner, with as much bone graft as I can. And in fact, one nice option with, with something like Magnifuse is that the, your bone graft extensor, extender, in terms of cancellous bone chips and so on, is put into a little sock. And you can actually, once you decorticate, you can pack that posterior lateral gutter uh, with this stuff to help promote fusion. So to, to answer your question, no, but that wasn't, that wasn't the aim. Yeah. So why did you decide again? The iliac bolt here because it's like long construction and it will be too much yeah. stress on L5 S1 there. Yeah, so that's that's a real good question. So so I, I had a little um, argument with myself about this, uh, and and the que and I would actually pose it the other way, and I would say, why did you go down to five? And and w does somebody want to offer a kind of thought process as to why uh, in this patient in particular we did not want to extend it to to the pelvis? Well, I know you know the answer, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely, exactly. You, if you, you extend it to the, to the pelvis uh, and you lose those mobile segments, where are you most mobile in the thoracolumbar spine? You're most mobile at L5-S1 and less so at 4-5 and, and less so. You take that away from a young patient, they're, they're not going to be thanking you each time they're in the bathroom, you know, needing to take care of business, you know, they're, they're not going to thank you. And, and there was no need in that patient. Now, had he had uh, a degenerative condition and extended to L5 and so on, and there was, you know, imbalance and we'd fused from, you know, L1 down to, to the sacrum or T12 down to the sacrum, of course, you know, that would be a consideration because we want stability, particularly at L5 S1 in these long constructs. Uh, but not in this patient, and, and it's kind of the same theory. Um, I'm sure Dr. Verma will, will sort of enlighten us, but with pediatric patients as, as to why you would ne you would not end uh, in the pelvis, but but your lower instrumented uh, vertebrae often at L2 or L3 or, and so on. Are you comfortable with your lowest instrumented level being five? In this patient, in, in this young patient here, um, I, I actually debated stopping at four with him. Um, I think maybe in retrospect that would have been a little bit of a better choice. Uh, but my, my concern was that I, I, my, my instrumentation would have otherwise been four and three so past, and it's two below yeah. this long construct, and I needed more points of fixation. So, so that's why uh, we took it to five. But, but I, I, I accept that point. Okay, so the next case, and, and we'll finish with this, um, is a elderly, more elderly woman uh, who presented to me with neck pain, myelopathy, uh, and, and severe progressive low back pain. She'd had an ACDF before, and she'd also actually had a uh, L3-4 decompression and interspinous device put in. Uh, she, was, she had horrible, horrible low back pain, but in fact, she was myelopathic uh, with multi-level central cervical canal stenosis. And to, to add to it, she was severely osteoporotic. Her uh, T and Z scores were, were particularly low. Uh, we, we, had, we went through the whole works. Uh, to our surprise, our 
endocrine uh, team didn't want to put her on uh, something like recombinant PTH for Teo, uh, but treated her with IV bisphosphonates over a period of time. And of course, she was on calcium and vitamin D and so on. So these were the spina pelvic parameters. Clearly, uh, she is forwards, uh, and she has a significant uh, coronal uh, imbalance as well. So uh, the first thing I did uh, was actually take care of the cervical myelopathy uh, and, and do a posterior multilevel uh, cervical decompression and stabilization. Oh, and, and also, so with the prior uh, uh, surgery, no fusion had actually been achieved. Um, and, and, and for us, uh, that, that was vindicated at the time of surgery when it all kind of came apart, when we remo removed the, the, that interspinous device actually has two components to it. There's the, the, the flange part, the outside, and there's more of a, a dowel ring between the spinous processes. So we took it a, a surgery, re we removed the device. Um, I decided to treat the deformity with multi-level lateral uh, cage placement. Uh, and that was packed with mesenchymal stem cells uh, because I, I, that was my first uh, procedure on her. And then we backed her up with a T10 to pelvis. Uh, and I think we got a reasonable correction of her deformity, certainly in the AP plane. I think we corrected her sagittally as well. Uh, we probably set her up for uh, the, the next disease that you will see based, based on the imaging there. Uh, but uh, she was, you know, she she was significantly improved. Low back pain markedly improved. She was markedly more mobile. Uh, she was utilizing a soft brace. Um, then she has a minor fall at home, onset of sudden pain, uh, decreased mobility. Uh, she we asked her to present to the ER. She's got now decreased motor strength to the legs, and of course there's some upper motor neuron signs, and there's our problem at T9. So this is definitely uh, a proximal junctional failure. Uh, and we talked about this yesterday with respect to, remember we, we mentioned that often it's, it's compression fractures, not just a ligamentous injury, but, but there is, there, there's a bony problem. So this was actually a T9, not a, not a T10. So it's UIV plus one. And so then of course, uh, I, I took her back. I should probably, you know, this is a question for you. So how would you treat her and what would you put in? So does somebody want to kind of give their opinion and, and their rationale behind it? Go ahead. Um, I mean, I think the construct would have to be extended as to be the extra compression in your case. Mm -hmm. Why you have some degree of the construct of that construct that's going to have to be extended. Mm -hmm. um, Where would you extend to? Let me take you back um, to... Mm -hmm. What what would that be here? What what's your choice here? Where would you take her? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would anybody be tempted to um, extend the construct to coalesce with the cervical instrumentation? Okay. We have one, two hands up there. Okay. Most people are either no or on the fence. So I decided not, you know, mainly because I, I, I felt that her, her pain stemmed from this region here. Her deficit was from this region here. And, and this is what needed to be. What bone graft would you, would you use in her with your extension? Um, so, you're doing a compression, so mm -hmm. presumably you will get a Significant amount of local bone graft, non neoplastic bone graft here. She's osteoporotic, but but you'll get a corpectomy amount of bone graft here. Um, what are you what are you going to put into the the vertebral space into the defect of your corpectomy? Um, maybe an expandable cage, although I guess with osteoporotic bone, you might really just mm -hmm. put pelvic bone that's going to hold. Yep, that's that's very good. So what's the alternative? Um, structural or fibula. Uh huh. Something like that. Okay. Like yep. Does any, anybody else have any other uh, suggestions? So, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, in other words, uh, so are you talking about allograft 
in this allograft. Okay, yeah. So, so a, a decent sized structural allograft, and that's what we did. We we use fibula struct graft here. Uh, we we kind of threw the works at her. Um, uh, for she had autograft. We wanted to have a bone graft extender there. Uh, we laid it in in as de decorticated all available dorsal bony surfaces and packed it on there to help achieve a, a nice arthrodesis. We extended it to T4 uh, and. Uh, you know, we, we corrected her and she improved. She, she regained her neurological uh, strength. Uh, we kept her in a TLSO. Uh, we did ongoing physical therapy. The pain improved dramatically. She was doing good. So two years later, she bends forward while exercising. I don't know what she was doing. She's probably doing, you know, senior Olympics or something. But <laughs> feels a loud pop and has immediate severe pain, and now feels a grinding no noise on walking. What do you think's happened? She's, she's fractured a rod. Yeah, exactly. Now, it didn't happen at, at the uh, thoracolumbar junction. This actually happened at L3-4. So L3-4 is where the, these, these fractures of the rod are. And what does a fractured rod tells you, tell you? I think, I think Dr. Hart kind of really kind of mentioned it. Pseudarthrosis, yeah. I mean, if you, have, if, you, if you have fusion, the scaffold is unimportant anymore and it cannot be or should not be a generator of pain in that situation. So she's not fused, despite the fact that, you know, we put in our osteocell mesenchymal stem cells in these big graphs, you know, at the front there, you can kind of see the AP for them. Uh, we, we, we cut the ALL at one point. That's why you saw one of them was a tabbed implant with a screw across the body. Um, we laid down autograft at the time, but of course she's osteoporotic at the time as well. Uh, we got nice fusion where the fibula strut graft was, right? Look at that. I mean, there's, there's, there's bone bridging there already, but this is our problem now. So what, what are, you, what are we going to do? What are our options at the moment? Remember, this is L3-4. You've already connected. We decided to connect with dominoes or with an inline connector at uh, T10, uh, T9 down to T11. No screws in T11 to accommodate for the inline connector. So what, what, is, what, what will you do? Will you add some? Uh, what are the options, actually? Fusion, but also the instrumentation here. I mean, this is at the bottom of a, of a long construct. What can you do um, with the parallel rods? Uh-huh. Uh, the one side is the, she's to the pelvis already? Yeah, she, she's down to, we put in S2AI screws, so. There it is. So you mean additional iliac fixation to this? Yeah, so you've got okay. Two yeah. Mm -hmm. But you've already got iliac. You've you've got pelvic fixation. That's not the the the, the problem here typically. Although it's you know an extra anchor in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so to Dr. Hart's point yesterday, it's an option to place it between S1 and 2 because then you're not worried about arthrodesis at that level being the sacrum as the lower anchor point. But yeah. So you would add a, like an outrigger rod, basically, yeah. satellite rod. That's just posterior. Right. Would you, what would you do with respect to the fractured rods? Would, you, uh, would that be your treatment? Would you, would you remove them and do inline connectors there? Or would you replace the rod? i try to replace the rod. The whole rod? OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With what? So inner body. Mm -hmm. But she's got inner body at every single level. I mean, she's had. So we did a five one T lift when we were uh, posterior to begin with, and then she had lateral put in from L one to L five, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any alternatives? So, okay. So we did some of that. 
So what we, what we thought, we thought about, okay, should we add the satellite, satellite rod here? Uh, and, and this is an option for next time, I think, as you'll see. Should we extend to the cervical construct? And what about tissue engineering and, uh, and you know, gene therapy? But basically what we did was the, the original rod was a titanium alloy, and so I replaced it with cobalt chrome. Uh, my, I, I was somewhat hesitant because she's osteoporotic. So in, in the fight between her, her low bone density and a stiffer rod, uh, I know that the stiffer rod will win, although she kind of demonstrated that, that maybe she wasn't, you know, maybe with treatment she wasn't so bad. So we basically extended it to, um, extended it up by certain, by, by an additional level, added a uh, interspinous uh, mercelline tape uh, up, up the top there uh, from memory, uh, added BMP, got in and decorticated uh, dorsal bone as much as we could see, uh, aimed to access the inner body at L3-4, uh, what was left of it available from the cage that was placed there, and add very, very small amounts of BMP uh, buttressed by um, gel foam and, and, and DBM. And... Uh, we did not choose a satellite rod with her uh, because I felt that her problem was pseudoarthrosis and that I wanted to achieve my, my goals with a much stiffer rod. Um, uh, we didn't extend to the cervical region again because, number one, I would have to add a connector and there would be more modularity with our instrumentation to connect there. Um, and secondly, I'm not aware of a transitional rod that, that, that goes from 3.5 to five five or, or six oh. This is, by the way, this is a a, a six, I think six point three five uh, rod now. So a uh, uh, six oh rod. So bigger rod basically, um, th thicker rod. So that was the reason behind it. But th these are good thoughts because maybe maybe next time we can add the satellite rod, we can extend and make it one construct and then. Think about some other options. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, so, so this is a good question. Where's Dr. Skuyan? Because I'd like to blame him right now, because um, <laughs> he conveniently exited the room when discussion of BMP for fellows. No. So, so tra traditionally, um, we we had been a, a big proponent of good end plate preparation, preparing the dorsal decorticated surface, using autograph and packing it as tightly as we could. Um, I, I had reserved BMP for people who'd failed, uh, either they're smokers or diabetics or obese or, you know, I got plenty of those patients, but, but you know, pe people basically who, for whom I really thought the index of, of failure was high. In retrospect, I think that this probably, she probably would have fit more in that category. Uh, but we had a huge amount of bone uh, harvested from all the osteotomies that we did for our correction. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, you know, I felt that she wasn't a smoker, she wasn't a diabetic. Yes, she was osteoporotic, but that was hopefully being treated and so on. Uh, and so, in retrospect, I, I mean, it's, I think it's a very good question. Maybe, maybe. Uh, you know, an appropriate sort of amount, not not a huge dose would have been would have been enough. But the but the other problem is that uh, you know in this construct from T10 down, where do you place it? You know, I I, I maybe you could have said well the maximum lordosis in the rod was probably at L34 if not L45. So that's most subject to stress. And don't forget that we bend these rods so we place stress rises in doing our notching for, for, for where we use our, our benders. So maybe that was a little bit more, you know, kind of in, in circumspect that was, that was where it was going to fail. But it's failed elsewhere. I mean, these constructs have rods that are broken everywhere. Yeah, I was kind of going to ask that question. Is there a common level that you see most often? Where yeah, I mean, I, I've seen it in this region, but I've also seen it um, a little higher. Uh, as well, I, I think it, it's kind of patient specific as well, and what alignment you achieve, because if you excessively correct them uh, with the lordosis, then they're they're going to have 
the, the, the stress of wanting to pull forward, maybe at the top more uh, cranial in the construct. Um, and then at the same time, if you bend that rod uh, very lordotic and really put stress on it, I mean, you, you're putting in a, a stress riser in a titanium alloy rod in, in, in particular. Um, so I would bet that it, they're more common at, this, at these levels, at the lower lumbar levels. Okay, hopefully that was useful. So thank you very much. Just remember, we got your back, okay? So thank you.